Heavenly Father, thank you so much just for your tremendous goodness. Um, Lord, there's just stuff going on out in the world. Uh, the battle overseas is very real and continuing. The battle on our own home country's turf is very real and continuing. The spiritual battle along with everything else that's going on. There's floods going on, Lord. There's all kinds of things happening in our world and Father, we ask for safety and protection, but we also ask that people would open their eyes and see that these are the signs that you told us were going to happen as, as your time comes closer to returning, and that we would not wait to make a decision for you. And so, Lord, I thank you that we are all here today to hear from you, and that each one of us would hear you speaking directly to our heart. And we just thank you for that, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we start our, our, our morning this morning, we're talking about what's the point of using our talents. And so we're going to start with Jesus' parable of the talents. Man, Jesus gets a hand. I like it. I love the pictures. I love watch movies often, uh, Jesus of Nazareth and those. And I, I love to see actual scenes where Jesus is you know, speaking, just like we saw there. Uh, people would gather around, crowds would come. This was a smaller crowd, but there are times we've talked about multitudes 
would show up around him. Tens of thousands of people, and often he'd feed thousands and thousands of people with just a couple of Big Macs and, and give it to them. And, but they would show up and they would listen. Now, we've talked about this as we, we go along. This is, the, this is a parable that he gave us. It, a parable is a story with, with, a, with a point. It's a, usually a fiction story that illustrates a moral attitude or religious principle. So what we just heard Jesus give us was a story, and he gave it to the crowds. And, and most of the times, uh, the crowds would, would enjoy the story. They would, find, they would hunt Jesus down. He was doing miracles. He was healing. He was raising the dead. He was producing food that they could be involved with. Jesus would be traveling through, and, and the people would go out and see him in, in great crowds. And, and he tells them this story. He talks about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is God's kingdom. He's talking about here on earth. Uh, with, with Christians and followers of Christ as citizens, of uh, those who know Christ are involved with that. That's, that's God's kingdom down here. It's a spiritual kingdom, not a, not a physical kingdom, but it's a spiritual kingdom of those who follow God and follow Christ. And he says, a man goes on a trip, and, and Jesus is preparing his followers. He's saying, a man goes on a trip for a long period of time. Jesus is talking about himself. Because we'll see as we go forward today, he's been announcing to his followers that, that he's going to be crucified. He's going to die. And he's going to go return to heaven for a period of time. So, so, the, so the man that's returning on, you know, on the trip is going to be Jesus. The servants or the Christians, the disciples, the followers around him who are called uh, to serve. And he says, okay, certain resources, money, are going to be given to those followers. Gifts talents, abilities, different things are going to be given to people so that when Jesus is in heaven, they can take those gifts, the talents, the money, whatever he gives them, and he use them for the kingdom of God to be part of telling other people about Jesus here on earth, a part of changing the kingdom of this earth into the kingdom of heaven here on earth. There's a task, a challenge that's given to each and every person to, to do it while he's gone. But then there's the give an account part. Because when Christ comes back and he sets up his full kingdom here on earth, there will be an accounting. There will be a time when he'll return and, and each of us will stand and, and we'll stand before him and we'll give an account for the tasks, the gifts, and the abilities that he's given us. How did we use them? If we're given five talents, there's some five talent people here who, who've got incredible abilities inside of Christ. These are not natural abilities. These are spiritual abilities that they can use. Some with the gift of mercy, with helping, with giving, with serving. All of these things, these gifts are inside of people. And, and some have, you know, gifts and, and they flow in five gifts. They have the ability to do that. Some he gives lesser gifts to, a couple gifts to it, and, and, and some to even just one. But he gives gifts to everyone. Everyone is gifted in Christ and is able to, to be used by him. But any accounting... When, when he comes back, have we used it? The first two, uh, obviously, uh, used theirs. The, the, he doubled the talents that were given to him, uh, the ones that he entrusted the money to. And, and he said to him, those things we want to hear, because there's really only two outcomes. Well done or depart from me. We obviously choose to hear well done. To, we we want to be able to use our talents and abilities the best we can to tell people about Christ. But there's something else that I, I'm going to focus in on today because I think it's something that we forget. We, we just saw a, a fictional presentation, a movie, if you will, of, of Jesus talking. So I wanted to make a point that's sort of obvious. Jesus was talking. No, no, no. Jesus the Son of God, the creator of all, who spoke worlds into existence in the beginning and who was with God and he was God. And he, he humbles himself and comes to this earth and walks among us. That's Jesus. What we're hearing is God speaking. These are not random thoughts. These are not good ideas. This is a direct communication from God. And not only is it a direct communication that we're hearing God's words, that are binding and, and 
should control each and every Christian. We should seek them out to follow him. But also, I put this up here because we sometimes forget he's also speaking as a prophet. Because when you tell the future, you're speaking as a prophet. A prophet, an inspired utterance of a prophet, a prediction of something to come. What's Jesus predicting? He's predicting his return. And he's predicting what's going to happen when he returns. When he returns, there will be a time that we will all stand before him. And, and really, as we do that, uh, as, as we look at the things that are there, there there's a choice that, that we're going to have. What's he going to say to us? So this, today we're going to be poking at prophecy and talking about it. Because Jesus' words aren't, aren't to be taken lightly because it's God speaking. And when he says something's going to happen in the future, it's going to happen in the future. What with him being God and all, you might expect that. So, uh, but as, as, as we look at this, we have to remind ourselves that, that parables were really for the crowd. We just read, we watched a video, we watched this thing up on the thing and everything. It's for the crowd. And, and we've talked every week that, that as he does that, uh, like he took his disciples aside when he was there, and, and they asked him, why do you speak in parables? Why, why do you use parables to the people, to the crowds that are there? And he says, now you, these are his followers, off to the side. After the crowds are gone, after all that's gone, he gets his, his followers, those who have left homes and families and travel with him, those who have committed their lives to him, those who choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And after the crowd departs, he gives them an inside briefing to the specific meaning of, the, of each of the parables that we've talked about so far as we've gone forward. He says that the crowds come, but they, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, have an abundance of knowledge. But to those who are not listening, checking the box, just showing up, hearing stuff, maybe coming to church consistently, but, but not listening for application. He says what little understanding they have will be taken away. They, they can understand the story, and they're cute stories. But if they're not taken for application, it's, it's a mill drill. It's, we're, just, we're taking laps. So Jesus says to the followers, I will explain it. And that's really what our goal is today, is, is to dig a little deeper into this. Not just to be entertained, but look and see how we can, how we can apply it to our lives. What's the inside meaning of this? Again, today, biblical Christians are, are 2% of our, are basically 2% of our population here. Most people just acknowledge God's existence, but they're not following. They're not fully committed to that. But again, we are responsible. We've said this several times. We are responsible for the outcome and our actions that are here. We're told to pay careful attention to what takes place. Pay careful attention to your own work. And then you'll get... Uh, the satisfaction of a job well done. There will be a time when we do stand before Christ. The verse says each of us is uh, destined to die once and then comes to judgment. There will be a time when we stand before God. Now, this is, again, remember, I want to I want to kind of emphasize this as we go. This is a prophecy. This is a promise that God's saying is going to happen in the future. So we should be careful because there will be a time that we'll be accountable for that. So as we, as we look at the parable and we look at what God promises in the future, there's two outcomes. We'll hear, we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Can you imagine that, that, that moment, that time? We stand in, in front of the holiness of God. The angels are singing holy, holy, holy. It's one of those times you walk in and, and, and the desire is just we don't belong there, but we've been so gifted in Christ and we stand there aware of our foolishness because we'll have perfect knowledge of how foolish we've been. We'll have perfect knowledge of the price that, that Christ paid on the cross and, and, and he'll look at us and he'll say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It says, joy, come on, join in. Let's celebrate together. We have to do that. That's, that's one of the options. 
But also if, we, if we've taken our, our talent, our gifts, our abilities, and, and we bury them, we don't use them, or we reject Christ altogether. But this is, uh, after the service last night, I waxed eloquently for a long time and talked about this, and then Brad Harlow came up to me and says, really what the problem was with this guy with the one, he took what God gave him and buried it. Can you think of a, if, if you gave a gift to your children and they put it in the back of the closet and just didn't use it at all? Well, that's that's the, the story that takes place. Two outcomes to this parable, and we get to choose which one it's going to be. Is it well done or lazy and slothful servant? Which is it? So again, I want to hear with new ears as, as we listen to, to what Christ says during this particular uh, parable. Again, the story of the man going away. Jesus goes away. And he's changed and he's give us, given us something. You see, the, the promise in one of the most, I think, exciting verses in the Bible comes out of Ephesians. Uh, it's 2.10. It says, for we're God's masterpiece. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're recreated in Christ. We call it being born again, transformed. We go from the old self to the new self. This, this, we're spiritually transformed. Now the Holy Spirit lives in us. All of our sins are removed. We're empowered with gifts, talents, and abilities. We're recreated anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things that he planned long ago. You know, one of the things is, I'm such a, I, I focus on today. But it's interesting that I focus on my today today. Jesus focused on my today before the world was founded. And he focused on your today before the world was founded. He knew the works and the things that we would do and we wouldn't knew, do before he created the world and before he created us. And when he recreates us in Christ Jesus, he empowers us and sends us out to do those things that are there. This is the promise. God knows the plans that he has for us. And, and they're to serve him in any and every way we can. This is for each and every follower of Christ. But I want to, I as we do this, I want to be sure that I turn around again and, and talk about prophecy, an inspired utterance of a prophet. Because when Christ speaks and he describes the future, that's exactly what he's doing. Why is prophecy so important? And I'm, I'm going to spend, I want to geek out a little. For those of you who know me, I love prophecy. It was prophecy, literally, that opened the door to know Jesus Christ for me. And so uh, as I was attending church, uh, I, had a, I walked in at attending church. It was the first time I walked in, and I was bushwhacked by God. It was the rudest thing you could ever imagine. It really was. I walked in, I was just making sure my kids were getting some Christian education, and I was going to go check the church box so I could make sure that this was an okay church for them to go to, and when I put them on the bus in the morning and sent them. And so I walk in, and, and there's this, uh, I think he's an Irish guy, he seems to see all the green out here, Scottish or something, anyway, foreigner of some side, top funny, uh, had his accent. But he, he started talking, and he would open the Bible, and he would read a prophecy, and then he would open the Encyclopedia Britannica, and he would show the specific fulfillment of that specific prophecy that was written hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of years before. And I, I'm sitting there, and I was a dumb Marine at the time, probably still am, but I had never heard any evidence for God. I had never heard any proof, the, the objective proof that there was a God. And so here's this, this foreigner standing in my country giving evidence that there is a supernatural being that can tell the future. I'd never heard of such a thing. He did that that whole service. He probably gave three, four, five prophecies, detailed them perfectly, laid them out. Here's what was happening. And then he went and showed the fulfillment of them. And so as he did that, he, he, prophecy grabbed me. And so I... I, as I was reading these things, as I was getting ready for this, I said, well, these are prophecies that Jesus is saying. We should listen to him because he's proven himself to be God. One of the verses 
It's on your outline uh, as you go through this or on your, I uh, think, I think our computers decided to, it must be an apple. <laughs> okay, uh, I only offended half of you. Hang around for a while. I'll get the rest as we're there. But, but here's what God says. And, and here's what he says to every religion in this world. Every philosophy in this world, every teaching in this world, everyone who says they stand up for truth, here's what he says. He says, present your case for your idols, for your philosophies, for your ideas, says God. Show, show me what you can do. The king of Israel, the living God, says, uh, let you, if you got it going on, if you're supernatural, if you're so smart, tell us what happened long ago. Give me accurate history. We'll consider the evidence. And here it is. And then let them tell us what the future holds so we can know what's going to happen. Yeah, tell us what will occur in the days ahead so we'll know that you're God. Very simple, very simple verse. But don't miss the impact. This is a game changer. When we read the Bible, we're reading God's word that has been validated as supernatural spoken from a voice beyond our reality not only he's not bound by our time he knows the future he tells the future and he proves it thousands of times in the bible hundreds and hundreds of prophecies just for jesus coming so when he says to us that we are god's creation built anew in christ jesus for good works that he prepared long ago that's a prophecy about you and me. That's a future telling of he has plans for us as he goes forward. So, so God says, present your case. Bring it, and we'll know. Thousands of fulfilled prophecies. Um, and again, this is, this is Jesus talking to his followers. And one of the things, and I love Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector and all this, but he was a Jew also. So as you read the story as Mark, or excuse me, as Matthew lays out Jesus' life, he's constantly using Jesus' prophecies before us. And, and this is one of them. He takes his, uh, he, Jesus was going to Jerusalem with his 12 disciples privately. And he takes them aside. This is one of those private briefings. He says, we're going to go to Jerusalem where the Son of Man is going to be betrayed by the leading priest, and the teachers of the law sentencing to die. They'll hand him over to the Romans. He'll be mocked, flogged, whipped, crucified. But on the third day, he'll rise again. He says, oh, by the way, in a couple of days, this is what's going to happen. We're heading for Jerusalem now. This is what's in front of us. A prophecy that came specifically true. But that, that's impact. That's, that's clearly right in front of him. But the impact is that it was described 700 years before. The prophet Isaiah said, a Messiah, a leader, a, an anointed leader from God is going to come. And he's going to be a sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb that will take away the sins of the world. He said, uh, back 700 years, he'll be despised, rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. He'll be rejected by his people. Even his own disciples turned away from him. He'll be despised like we didn't care. But... He'll carry our weaknesses and our sorrows that weigh him down. We'll look at him, and it's, it's a punishment from God. When Christ was being crucified, people were saying, oh, see that sinner? He's getting what he deserves. And this, is a, this was talked about him, this Messiah coming. He'll be pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so we can be whole, whipped so we could be healed. And the obvious acknowledgement, like all, you know, all of us like sheep have gone astray. But yet God lays all of our sins on this lamb. Prophecy given 700 years before. Isaiah uh, speaking under the anointment, anointing of God. Prophecy, and this is exactly what's coming true. 700 years later, Jesus is predicting it. A few days later, he walks in on Palm Sunday, triumphal entry. Everyone is going crazy. Here comes this Messiah. But you see, they weren't looking for the suffering Messiah they weren't standing out there yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They didn't, they pushed that Messiah aside. They wanted another Messiah. They wanted a conquering Messiah. Again, a prophecy had been given uh, years before in Isaiah, same prophet. He said a child will be born. Or the government will rest on his shoulders. He'll be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, 
uh, Prince of Peace. The government of peace will never end. He'll rule with fairness. He'll come with the armies of heaven. They were looking for a conquering Messiah that would come in and, and, and kick the Romans out, turn the government back over to the Jews. And this is another prophecy. Well, Jesus didn't fulfill this. When's he going to do this one, by the way? We just talked about it. When he comes back to earth and sets up his kingdom. When he gathers us before him. He will come. At that time, uh, the government will be upon his shore, shoulders. He'll be a wonderful counselor, mighty God. He'll rule here for a thousand years with us. But that wasn't what was going to take place when Jesus came that time. He, he comes as a suffering so Messiah. He comes and he dies for us and takes our sins. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. He walks in on Palm Sunday. They're saying, Hosanna. A couple days later, they're saying crucify him. They turn their back on him, turn him over to the Romans. And so he does this, and he, he's telling his disciples what's going to happen. And he takes them aside. I'm going I'm to do something that I think is, is incredibly powerful for me as far as one of Jesus' prophecies are concerned, showing that he was the Son of God speaking here on earth. As Jesus was in each day in the temple, healing people in the temple, teaching in the temple, one day, as, as he's leaving the temple, his disciples said, wow, that temple is so cool. Now, the temple uh, back in that day was recreated. It took 47 years for King Herod to rebuild the temple, and so the Jews would have a place. It had been destroyed before. As you take a look at it, it shines. They, they polish the marble. You could, the sun reflected off it. Gold across the top, pillars with gold. They would encrust jewels in it. It was, it was the center of their worship. And it was every Jew wanted to be at the temple because this was, this was God's place. And, and every year, every male Jew had to go three times a year to, to the temple to fulfill the feast. People came from all over the world to see this temple it, for miles and miles away. I was driving in today and uh, I'm coming down Ridgecrest Boulevard going this way looking over Trona, and I had never seen it before. I've lived here a week or two, but I had never seen on the top of the Panamint Mountains, as you look straight down the road to Trona, there's a building, and it was reflecting sun. There was this twinkly light. I don't think it was Trona. It was a building up on top of a hill. Never seen it before. That's what the temple was like. They would see it from miles and miles away when the sun hit it just right. It was this glorious thing. And so the disciples were blown away by it. Uh, his disciples pointed out to him uh, the various temple buildings, but he responded to him, you see these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. This wonderful temple that took 47 years to build, he says it's going to be demolished. And, and not only is it going to be demolished, not one stone will be left on the other. These, some of these stones in there were as big as a semi-truck, if you're, you know, the, the length and the weight of them. Uh, these were huge hunking stones. They'll be completely demolished. Every stone will be moved from it. And so Jesus later goes to the Mount of Olives and, and his disciples came and said, when's that going to happen? And what will be the signs of your coming? You know, I, I was getting ready for that prophecy and, and talking about what that would look like. It, it turns out that after Jesus does that, 36 years later, that's exactly what happened. Uh, in 70 uh, A.D., at the Feast of Passover, where all the Jews came, just like they do today, and come into Jerusalem, the Romans circled the town, let them come in, and then they closed the gates so they could slaughter them all. They starved them for some period of time. They breached the wall. Over a million Jews were killed. The, and those who weren't killed were taken away as slaves to be sold inside the Roman Empire. And the temple itself caught on fire. All that gold melted, went down between the rocks. I love this. Every rock was moved. Every stone was moved, just like Jesus said. One of the most amazing specific prophecies ever given and fulfilled in detail in history. Now, what would that be like in our time? I, I, I know this is a stretch, but I, I came up with this example. Uh, most of us are familiar with the, what the Twin Towers were. And, and how they got put up. And so let's talk about that. In 1973, the Twin Towers 
were dedicated and given to the world. April 6th, 1973, they said, this is the World Trade Center. This is where the whole world will come and do trade. This will be the focus. This huge building, this monument is going to be there. And this is going to be the economic center. Everyone, whoa. What if a, a tour guide, and you were there, and, and they point to this, and they say, you know, it's going to be torn down. Not one bit of it would be remaining on top of each other. It'll go flat. You'd go, yeah, well, you, what wacky-backy are you using? <laughs> That's an equivalent of Jesus telling them that their temple was going to come down. Because we know September 11th, 2001, that's exactly what happened. I don't know about, for me, I look at that in, in Jesus' specific prophecies, specifically fulfilled, is one of the most encouraging things that I can hear. Because he's given me some prophecies. He's saying, I'm not going to die. He says, I'm going to see him face to face. He says, I have plans for you. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in minimum wages last week. I'm going to see Christ face to face. These are promises that he's given us. These are prophecies that he's put in front of every follower of Christ. And as we watch throughout history the specific fulfillment of his promises, we can stand confident and sure in the future that we will see him face to face. Jesus said that he would rise again. That's exactly what he did. You know, he, his disciples were so blown away by this prophecy as they were walking away. They come up and they, they asked him, I said, when will this happen? What will be the signs of your coming? When will you come back? Because he told them he was going away. He was a traveler going away and he was going to come back. And tell us what will, this will happen. And he gave us a list of prophecies we call it the Olivet Discourse. He's sitting across on the Mount of Olives, looking back at Jerusalem and looking at the temple, and he starts to describe what's going to take place. How close are we, is what they were really asking, to you setting up your kingdom here. He's already told him he's going to be a suffering Messiah. He says, when are you going to be a conquering one? And he gives him the signs of the times. I encourage, I, I do this regularly. Of course, I, I read through regularly. Matthew 24, he says, these are the signs of the end times when he's coming back. Wars, rumors of wars will be taking place. Nations fighting each other. Uh, even more in history as they take place. Uh, nations will be going against each other. Famines in the world. Earthquakes. We just heard about floods in the Midwest is underwater right now. Persecution of Christians. Millions of Christians, excuse me, tens of millions of Christians have died on Jesus' prophecy. And even this year, 100,000 will die. Christians will be hated all over the world. Would you ever have thought of a time... The Christians would be maligned, hated, and marginalized in the United States for standing by certain beliefs, by standing by the Bible principles that were there. Could you ever imagine that? Jesus said it would happen. And, and that's exactly what's happening. Not only here, but all over the world. Jews are being persecuted all over the world. Israel's a nation again after being scattered. The impossible happened. Jews came back together, and in one day, the United Nations made them a nation. The signs of Jesus' return and the fulfillment of the parable that we're talking about is right in front of us. And Jesus says, keep watch. Be ready. Because that moment of the fulfillment and the promises of each and every one of these is going to take place. A day is coming. That, that Daniel talked about where an antichrist will enter the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Uh, these things are going to take place. So it takes the idea of the, the parable of the, of the sensible servant, you know, uh, and, and, and brings it home to us. You know, the promises are in front of us. And Jesus gives many parables after he gives this prophecy. Keep watch. So the parable of the homeowner is the first one that he gives. The parable of the homeowner, he gives, he gives five, prop, five, sorry, sorry, five uh, statements in a row that are parables. Each one means the same thing. It's the parable of the homeowner. If you would watch your house, no one's going to break in. 
the bottom line of that, uh, that the Son of Man, when, for the Son of Man will come when you least expect him. Be ready if you're a house owner. The next one, the parable of the sensible servant. A faithful servant is responsible. He takes care of the management underneath him that's there. The next prophecy or the next parable that Jesus gives is a parable of ten bridesmaids. It's, it's one of the neat ones where the groom would go away. We don't do this anymore, uh, but this was the Jewish custom. When you came up and you proposed to someone, and the sweet young thing said, yeah, I'll marry you. Uh, he didn't stay and hang out and just eat her food. He went back to his dad's house, and he would build a house for his bride. And then he would come when the house was finished, and he would get his bride, and they'd go to his house, and they'd be married. So... The bridesmaids, their job was to stay awake at night because this groom could show up at any time. And, you know, guys are very undependable. But anyway, and so whenever he showed up, the bridesmaids, it was their job to be on duty, light the candles at night and everything else. Ten bridesmaids, five of them were ready, five weren't. The question, and again, the obvious story of the parable, uh, keep watch for you don't know the hour he's going to return. Be prepared for the return of the king, because when he comes back, it's going to be the wedding supper of the lamb. He's going to come back for his bride, the church. And the last parable, uh, the next to the last one, and this one is the parable of the talents. We just went over it. He says, use your talents. The kingdom of God uh, is a story of Jesus going on a long trip. And he's called you. He's called me. He's called his followers to be faithful. He's given you and me abilities, talents, gifts. And the call is to be faithful with them. To invest them, to bring other people to know Christ. To multiply his kingdom. To bring, to bring blessings to the people around us in Jesus' name. So that they might be transformed and changed. It's a fictitious story. But the moral attitude and the religious principle is very clear. And it's also a prophecy. It's going to happen. Just as all the other prophecies continue to unfold around us, this return of Jesus Christ is going to take place. You know, summary and application, God is not a man. He does not lie. He's not human. He doesn't change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? You need to answer that. Because it defines our life today. If we believe that he's spoken and always acted, if he's consistent to his word, then we believe it when he says he's coming back. If he promises, he'll carry through. And when Christ comes, there'll be this moment, which I can't even imagine. Everyone on earth at one time... It's described multiple places. When Jesus comes back, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens and there will be a deep mourning upon all the people of the earth. But then they're going to see the Son of God coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He'll send out his angels with a mighty blast of the trumpet. He'll gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the forest ends, and we will see him face to face. We will be with him for a thousand years in Jerusalem. I've been to Jerusalem once. I really want to go back. This is a new form of air mail and, and air travel that we're going to have. Because when he comes back, we go with him to Jerusalem. Don't worry about your luggage. This is, this is the future. This is the promise that he gives us when he comes back. Uh, and we can know it's going to happen. And what we want to hear is the master full of praise. Well done, good and faithful servant. The outcome of that is our choice. You know, the long term, the master returns. He's created us anew for good works for 2,000 years. This promise has been in front of us. And my personal opinion is, is we're coming into that age where it's very close. I, I'm not going to be foolish enough to say it's going to be next week. But I think, no, uh, I, I believe that it's so set up as we look around today. 
And again, when it comes to serving Christ, please remember, serving Christ is not a time issue. It's a love issue. We have time to serve those or what we love. If we love money, if we love career, if we love position, if we love ourselves, we serve ourselves. If we love Christ, we serve him. Very simple. And, and Christ gave us a way of reminding ourselves of that, of his love for us and his agreement with us. We, we actually call it communion. And regularly as a church, we stop and take a step back and remind ourselves how good our God is. In this very week that we're talking about, Christ gathers his disciples together again for a briefing. And he, and he takes a cup and he takes some bread. And, he, and, 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 and Paul talks about it. He says, hey, on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread and gave thanks for it, and he said, broke it to pieces. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way he took the cup and passed. This is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed in my blood. This is an agreement that God confirmed to us in the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. We're announcing and waiting. I love this. We're announcing the Lord's death until he returns again. So we've been talking about today is him coming back. So as we take communion, I encourage you to come forward and take the cup and the elements and, and back to your chairs. But one other thing, we live, in a, we live in a time where we have to remind ourselves to examine ourselves that are we in the right place with Christ? If there's some, some reason that you don't feel you should, if you're not a follower of Christ, if you're one of the crowd and you're just checking God out, Communion is probably not the thing to celebrate because it celebrates the relationship. But if you're in that place with Christ, please join us uh, celebrating the body and the blood of Christ in our relationship with him. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, search our hearts. Search our hearts. Show us. Again, reveal anew your love to us. Show us where we are with you. What can we be doing? Lord, are we hearing well done? Speak well done to your servants, Lord. And encourage those that need encouragement. Correct those that need correction. We thank, thanks that you'll do that because we ask in Christ's name. Amen.